All right, well, welcome, you guys. So glad you're here. I see some new faces. I am especially glad you're here. Um, today, we're going to be entering into a conversation on baptism, which will be like, oh, um, I promise this will not be the normal way to approach into this. And I also just want to say, if you have no idea what we're talking about when we first start and you're new, just write it out. You'll catch up. Because what I'm going to do with us now is I just want to start with conversation. I want you to break into discussion groups and I want you to discuss this because this is the kind of question that we as pastors face all the time and those in full-time ministry face all the time. In the weeks previous up today, we've been talking about how there's a different view of what church is, understanding of what we're here for, and when the two views kind of cross paths, there's a collision oftentimes. And sometimes it's good, and it leads to repentance and following the Lord, and sometimes it's not. And these are difficult, hard conversations. And when baptism is discussed within the life of our church, especially baptism for infants, this is especially true. And so I want to give you a scenario up on the board to talk about. I'm going to ask you, put yourself in the place of a pastor, who I'm called to administer the sacraments faithfully in this church, and ask yourself... What would you do? All right? That's the goal for today. Because this, I have experienced this so many times, this exact kind of conversation. So here we go. Here it is. Real life conversations happen this month. Someone comes to St. John's for a baptism of their child, or you're visiting with them, you find out they are not members. Don't currently attend a church. Don't plan on joining a church. Don't really know what baptism is, and believe Jesus is one of many truths. So the question is, do you schedule a baptism? Absolutely. No, no, that's your question. <laughs> that would have been too easy. No? Okay, let me extend the question. Why? Oh. Or let me even more, what do you do then? That's where it gets difficult, because to say no to someone would be, well, that's not, that's not what you do. They say this stuff to you and you go, no. All right, it was nice meeting. Go, split up into groups, six to eight, discusses what do you In that business of We'll come back to this question, that's how we're gonna end. This church, that would uh, I just wanted you to church. get in the midst of the struggle, you know, a get the frame of mind right. You know, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate. Is there anyone that looks around and says, oh yeah, easy. Anyone? I got this. Easy. Let's write it down on a little document. Slide it over. Just follow this plan, Pastor. Anyone? Oh, man. I was really hoping someone <laughs> had it figured out. <laughs> These conversations are so hard, and they're so weird. It's so weird. Why would someone come for a baptism that doesn't believe Jesus is Savior and Lord of the world? Does anyone else just kind of go, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, in one sense, it's so strange, but it is our reality. It's just the way it is. And it's an incredible opportunity. Because people are coming to the church for something still. Those days are going to go away, but they're still here now. Whatever, whatever the reason, the remnant, whatever it is. But I think, it's, I think it's important for us to do a little bit of review, kind of walk back through and step through some things that we've already done before. And so... Do you remember when I shared this? And for those of you who weren't here, this is a catch-up. The thing that really got me thinking along the line of these three truths was this question I heard in one of these baptism conversations that was very similar to the scenario I put on the screen. And it was 40 minutes into the conversation, and the person said this. And they were so sincere. They really meant it. They meant that this, that it was important to them. And that's true. I, I know it's true. For what it was, and for what they believed God was, and what they believed the church was, it was really important to them. In fact, they would probably even say, like I've heard many times, it was the most important thing to them. And they mean it. Alright? And so, this is kind of how it looks for them. This is what that statement made me realize was going on. They have their life compartmentalized in all the different things you do. And one really important part of their life is religion, God, faith. 
And in fact, they would say, a lot of people would say, I don't know about this couple, but a lot of people would say that it's the most important part, that it's the center of my life. But yet, when it comes to all these other things of life, job, recreation, finance, parenting, fitness, marriage, whatever it might be, the connection's not made there because God is there in that place that does specific things. And when I want my God stuff, I go to my God box. And I want my finance thing, I go to my, my um, what's that tax thing? Turbo tax. And when I go to, when I want the fitness, I go to the YMCA, or at least I buy a membership so I feel good about myself. <laughs> whatever it may be. This is what I do, and this is kind of how it was playing out. And when you would when you would talk to them, you just miss. And there'd be this, and then if you actually did connect and they understood what you were talking, there'd be a collision. And it would sometimes be painful and sometimes fruitful and always messy. But for us, as we gather here in this place, where we're about it is, and you notice the hand in the back, all of these things rest in whose hand? God's. That's how a Christian thinks. So he is the all-encompassing, the, the, the world in which we live, the salvation in which we breathe, the guidance that leads us against ourselves. That's how we think. So when you hear this, you might not even have thought it was a big deal. When someone says God's the most important thing in my life or most important part of my life, you don't even think about it, that that is actual heresy. That's idolatry. Because when you put God in a box, what are you? God. Only God has the ability to put things in boxes. All right? And so, this launched me into a time of, of really just exploration. And I thought, hmm, this is what is going on? How do you get this? How do you connect? How do you bridge that gap? How do you make connections? Even if it, even if it results in a collision, how do you make those happen? And we came up with those three truths. But really, a step behind the three truths is I realized what was going on is when people are coming to the church, they're coming for something specific. Are they coming for God's design? No. Not interested. They're not interested in that. There are a lot of times these families are living together outside of marriage. Are they coming for God's design? No, because when you talk to them about it, they go, what are what? Are, what, are, what? Right? Um, God's design is that who is responsible for the faith of their children? Parents. Sitting on the couch with these families over and over and over, we'd be talking about them, and inevitably it would come up, why are we talking about us? Well, because God's design is who would raise their children in the Lord? You. Well, you're the expert, Pastor. Yeah, but I'm not the parent. You see this? So they're not coming from God's design. Are they coming for God's law and expectations? They're coming for sometimes. Sometimes, I don't know whether it's magic, it's a, what you do, it's generational, but when they're coming for good reasons, they're coming for forgiveness. If someone asked the question, does a child who dies and not baptized go to heaven? And the answer is, yeah, I don't know. Now that's really hard to say. There's a giant question mark there. What does baptism erase? And the question. That's why it's such a gift. It brings assurance that God has done his thing. They ask that. That's true. But it's never meant to be done outside of all the truths of God. Jesus is not the only person of the Trinity. In fact, he doesn't even make sense apart from the rest of them. Whose world is this? Say it out loud. God. It's all his, including the Son. And the Son has come to save. We know this. Amen. And the third thing is, his will is what's best for us. Even when it's not your will. In fact, especially most of the time when it's not your will. And these truths are all true. And for us... What it's coming down to is they're coming for the gifts of the Son, but they don't want the headship and the fatherhood of God the Father, and they don't want the leading of the Spirit. And so, do you schedule a baptism? Well, this is a really complicated conversation. Do you see this? Because we are, we believe in the triune God of all of life. Whose hand do we dwell? 
And those three truths are true for every aspect of life. And the way he works in our lives is true for every aspect of life. And so we talked about this, I think, last week. This is what we got going on. I recognize this is what we got going on. People believe in me and Jesus. They kind of don't think about the Father or the God's law or believing in the Spirit or those things. It's just me and Jesus. I got my salvation. And so the first step of this is you come to the church when you have a baby and you get them. So they're assured. The question mark's gone. Boom, they're in. And then you have this when you show up. When you want to come, what's there for you? Communion. And then when your kids turn 13, confirmation. What about the rest? Um, it's on there somewhere. Maybe. Right? You go to church? Do you pray? Sometimes. Do you read the scriptures and do a Bible study? Do you give a first fruit to the Lord? What are you talking about? <laughs> and the reality is, this is just where we live. We've got to recognize it. The magnifying glass out, God is optional. And so all the things of God, of course, are optional. But the thing you want to make sure is that your kids are in heaven. So you get them. Now, the sad part is that's going away too. It's not, they're not even coming just because they want their kids to have God's forgiveness. I don't even know why sometimes. It's so weird. Um, but when, when they're coming out of a sense of dedication and wanting the Lord's forgiveness, at least we've got that going for us. And this all, this is review again, all of this is the creedal life, what it means to live in the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and His creation by His grace through His Spirit. And those are those truths. Um, for us then, we look at life like this. It's all in His hands. Everything we have, when our marriages are struggling, we know that who gave our spouse to us. And why is it hard? Sin. Did you guys know that? How about you, Adam? <laughs> yeah. That's why they're hard, and that's why God's grace and mercy is essential. Pastor Jeff Hesse preached his first wedding sermon yesterday, and what was central to it? Well, let me just do a little marriage lesson here for you. I'm a professional marriage counselor trained by a six-hour course. <laughs> Key to a happy, successful, God-blessed marriage, say these words. No? <laughs> it's not yes, dear. You will actually... You will actually... That is an easy route. <laughs> At least initially. Until you're painting, scraping, and doing all the stuff on the house. You're like, why am I doing this by myself? Anyway, that's another... That is not covered in the course. That <laughs> this is what you have to... Excellent. Man, woman, whatever it is, say these words after me. I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> How'd that feel? <laughs> it's so foreign. <laughs> I actually heard one of our members say this on Friday, Thursday or Friday at the height of auction preparation to their spouse. They started the conversation with those words I was so proud of them. I think they just went to the same course because I never talked about it. <laughs> I was wrong. And it was like, oh, no. Nah. <laughs> I know sometimes when I say that, that's not enough. It's like, yes, you were. <laughs> but all following after the I was wrong is, no, no, no. You can't forgive unless, because this is the second hardest part of that. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And then the hardest part of all of this is to be the one who was wrong. Because then you have to. Yeah. I forgive you, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> I just wanted to be mad for a while. I'm still going to be mad. Does that sound familiar, anybody? All right. Heads nodding. It's good to be church. And the point is, that's God's salvation. He saves. And then His will is what's best for you. It's just approach life understanding you're, you're sinful. Right? God has a design for marriage. And when you follow it, it actually works okay. It's still going to be bad because they're sinful. 
This is going to be way better than if you don't. And that's what we believe about life. He saves, his will is what's best for you, and it's all his. So we come back now to baptism. And it's important for us to just pause and reflect on, I just want to do some basic teachings on baptism. This isn't going to be like, welcome to Baptism 101. Just a few basic things about baptism. What happens in baptism, and I like to say it this way, I never heard it this way. Oh, maybe I did, I just don't remember. But I like this. Jesus died for the sins of who? Say it. Everyone. The whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have. And that's for? In baptism, he brings the work of the cross, his death and his resurrection, to you. On the cross, it's for everyone. In baptism, it comes to who set this up? Jesus set this up. Who made this commission? Jesus gave this commission. And the Apostle Paul talks about this. He talks about how the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit is bringing the gift of the cross to you. So do you know you belong to God? Yes, you do, because who did it? And where did he do it? At baptism, through the water and the... We are Lutheran. Say it. Woo! Yes. <laughs> This is it. Sacramental. God has attached himself to physical means just like he's always done throughout scripture. And he comes and we know he's alive and active. We don't have to have it be a personal experience, a set of beliefs, our ability to understand him, our ability to live a certain way. It's dependent on God. And this comes from Romans chapter 6. We know this. Paul teaches on this. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus... We're baptized into his what? All right. We were buried, then, therefore, with him into baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might what? So if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be uni united with him in a... So at baptism, you have a death and a resurrection and a new life. And whose work is it? Jesus. And when it happened, it happened. The question mark about whether you belong goes away. You know who did the work? That's right. Jesus, God, and you had what to do with it? Amen. It's assured because whose work is it? And so your doubts and your frustrations and your inability to live don't have anything to do with it. You belong. Amen. And this is what happens as a result. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set. And so we walk in the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So my question is, why don't we just load up the super soakers then and head to the Washington County Fair because we could get thousands. <laughs> And it would be fun. <laughs> right? Especially if we could hijack one of their hoses. Just spray them down. Push people into the ponds. You'll thank me later. <laughs> Why don't we do that? So this is happening. Luther goes so far as even Satan could do a baptism and it would be, it would be official because it's whose work. Which, that's weird, thought it was going to happen. But, it would be. An unbeliever could do it, and it would still be a baptism, because who's doing the work? So why don't we just shove people in the pockets? We can get way more that way. That'd be funny. Because the Lord commands us that we are to go make disciples by baptizing, and, and the two are not to be separate. <laughs> and so where there's no relationship with the Lord, and no follow-up, it's not appropriate to have a baptism. It's meant to happen in the body of Christ. That's what you're being baptized into, Christ's body, his church, those people, even when they're not what they should be. And it's a big deal. And it's really, really important that that faith be sustained for 
Jesus brings the cross to us in baptism and then continues to bring his cross all the way through life, through his word and through his sacraments and through his church. And that's the way it's meant to be. Who set this up? Yeah, the body of Christ. There is one body, many members, we all belong. This is Jesus' design, not our design. All right? And so baptisms happen, people come to us, and they come for the forgiveness. Is that good? Amen. That's great. But then you have this. This is just foreign to Jesus. Jesus does not say this. He does not say this. But it's optional. You can pick, pick and choose the things you want for your own spiritual walk. No, he sets it up the way it is. We're called to follow. And so when you come to this real life conversation, someone comes to St. John's for a baptism of their child, do you schedule the baptism? And the answer is, we want to schedule a baptism. Anybody? Yes. Please, Lord, hopefully. But this is the question that's asked. What do you want from us? When the collision happens or when the connection is trying to be made or when you're talking this way and they're, they're talking this way and they get all frustrated, what, what are we talking about us for? What do you want? And the redirection that's happened so many times in my office, I can't, and it's all the pastors, is, well, what does Jesus say? That's really the question that we would hope would be asked. What does Jesus say? Because I, I don't even know what I want. But I know what Jesus wants. And what does he want? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and he has killed you, he has raised you, he has made you his own, he's done all the work, and now he bids you follow. And that's kind of where the rubber hits the road, and where people repent and turn from themselves and follow, amen, we're scheduling the baptism, they have to look perfect, no, you have to go to church 100% of the time for four months straight, and then you can have a baptism, no, but there needs to be repentance and, and a promise. Hey, I see this as my role. I'm going to do this. And the question, the answer is, and we're going to talk about this some more, but the hope always is to get that to that point. To get there. Actually, I'm going to stop. Are there any questions? I haven't done this like the whole time. Are there any questions from you guys on this? Well, we know for sure he's brought them here to be baptized. The child didn't walk in on his own. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the question that Jesus would ask is, well, I don't, let me ask you, if the Holy Spirit walked into your office, would you recognize him? Me neither. The only place I would know where he's at is in word and sacrament, because that's where he promised to be. Can he be wherever he wants? And let me ask you this, can Jesus save whoever he wants? Yeah, because he's Jesus, right? But for us, who live in this limited physical place, we know that the Holy Spirit is alive and active where? Nope, we know that. But word and sacrament, physically. When there's communion, who's there? The Holy Spirit. When there's a baptism, who's there? When a pre preacher is preaching the sermon, who's there? The Holy Spirit. Because that's the promise of Jesus. Anything else? Don't know. And that's why it's a physical, material means. We're not spiritualists. The Lord has tied himself to physical means. Can he do it every once? Amen. So when someone gets a crazy vision and they tell you about it, you go, right? There's a movie that just came out, Heaven is for Real. I always play this over there. No. Heaven is for Reals. And, uh, and that's the perfect example. What was that? Do this with me. It's crazy. It's a good story. Where do you want to know that the Lord has called you and made you his own? We go to scripture. Where did it happen? 
baptism. Is heaven for real? Why do we know heaven's for real? Because Jesus said so. Right? We don't need a crazy experience. And who knows what that is? Could that have been Satan? Yeah, the Satan do crazy things and, and like to trick Christians. Right? So, is it a good movie? Sure, it's great. Go watch it. But in the end, you know heaven's for reals because who said so? And who's there right now? Yeah, everyone always wants an experience with the Lord, and we have the sacraments. It's an incredible experience. The question is, how do you faithfully administer them? And when someone's rejecting the Lord, who says, who's the one called to be responsible for raising that child in the Lord? And will the baptism be real? If you were to take that child, take him to the front of the church and baptize him, would it be for real? Yes. It would happen. And then they, oh, were you here last week? Two weeks ago? They would immediately start being what? Starved. Intentionally starved from God's word. So yeah, we could go spread the people down at the fairgrounds and they would leave and immediately start being Starved. And what happens to starved faith? It dies. We know for sure. Who's the judge of when it happens? Yeah, but the point is, let's have the conversation now. The goal would be for them to bring their child forward and make the promises that a parent should make when they bring an infant forward, which is, I will raise this child in the Lord. I will dedicate my life to following him. Yeah, this is hard, though, because sometimes what do they do? Yeah, they say, no way. And they take their kids, and they go where? I don't know. It's like, oh, killer. <laughs> no doubt. He does. He doesn't say not to baptize. He says, Jesus says, bring all these little children to me. Are they bringing them to God? They think they are, no doubt. And so what's the goal? Is the goal just send them off and say, no, you don't meet the criteria? No. And this is where it gets down to. <coughs> this can be a starting place. But it can't be their end all. And there needs to be a recognition, at least in the conversation, that God is greater than just the things you want from Him. They don't have to be perfect or whatever, but there has to be a repentance and say, no, the Lord has called me to follow. So things like, I'm not going to go to church. Why would I go to church? I don't need church, just me and Jesus. That's a problem. What's a church? I know, but what's a church? Word and sacrament. And where are people fed? Word and sacrament. Do you have communion in the home? Nope. Are these parents preaching God's word to their kids? Nope. And so, yeah. Who is the one that, should, and that needs to be confronted here? It's not the church. It's who? The parents, you see that? Now you see why this is so hard. Because you got that passage, let the little children come to me. And do we want them to come to us? Yes. Oh, yes, we do. Do we ever say no? I just want you to know. Do we ever say no, there will not be a baptism? We never say no. Do they sometimes think we're saying no? Yeah, well, just give it me the way I want it. Just do this. Let's just schedule this thing. No. We're talking, keep talking. Great question. Isn't it possible the Holy Spirit will still stay there? That, that works if your presupposition is the Holy Spirit's not there anyway. Does that make sense? Who does that child belong to? If the Lord wants them to have faith, are they going to have faith? Yes. And is this the Holy Spirit's world alive and active all over the place? So then when you give them the gift of faith and don't take into account any of the other stuff that the Lord calls us to, are you being faithful? 
You're giving, and this is going to sound horrible, but when you don't do this with conversation around it, discipleship conversation, you're giving false assurance. Because what you're saying is, yep, they got the gift of faith. It's immediately going to start being starved. Go to, see ya. God's word calls to repentance. So it's all together there. They're not a either or. And to baptize a child with no conversation around it would be like going to the fair with a super soaker. We would never do that. That would be inappropriate. Well, it's kind of inappropriate in the office, too. Now, let me stop and pause. you got to see this. This is kind of a new phenomenon. We didn't have to have this conversation. People would not come to the church and say, I want this stuff that the church has, this forgiveness of sins, but I want nothing else to do with God, or that Jesus is the only way or the truth of life. That's a culture. That's a culture right here. Um, let me see. Where is it? Ah. Uh, Oh, it's way back there. That's this culture we live in now. Do you see this? And, and this is the truth. They come, and we used to do it, they, we'd, bat, we'd schedule the baptism, and then we'd work with them after. What's the problem? They're not there. They're telling you they're not going to be there. See how this is so hard? Question. Yes. Amen. None of them are in church. Is that painful? Yes, it's painful. Does anyone else have family like this? Raise your hand high so everyone else can see that we're not alone. I said, is it painful that their kids, their grand nieces and nephews, maybe grandkids, brothers or sisters, aren't connected to the Lord's church, have wandered away? Anyone? Yep. You know what that's called? Sin and the mission field. The Lord has called us to call those people to repentance. Jesus' first words in his ministry, repent and follow. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. His call to his disciples, follow me. It's in Matthew. This is nothing new. Is it easy? No. You go and talk to their parents, what are they going to say? Yeah. And that's... You said... You said the mother knows, she goes to church faithfully, but the father doesn't. None of the... But he never went. None of the kids are Christian. And that's... We go back to God's design. It's just the way it is. Our father's influential in our children's lives. Yep, the secular statistics show that when a father is faithful in worship, people, their kids, up to like 68%, stay faithful. When just the mother is, it drops down to 33%. And you could be like, well, that's sexist. It doesn't matter. It's God's design. They're supposed to be the what there? A father and. And when the father and mother are both faithful, it's like 80-something percent. And if a father and mother are doing what we talk about here, making the connections for their kids, it's better. Do people still fall away? Yes, because of? Yep, and it's hard to follow God. Anyone else? But this is what we're talking about. Baptism is another point along the way. And I just want to stop and thank, thank you guys up here for these questions. I, if I was flippant or uh, kind of dismissing, I don't mean to be. And I understand how sensitive it is, because look at all the hands that raised when you said this. How many of you have kids that aren't baptized yet, and you desperately wish they would be baptized? You have our grandkids, or family, or friends? Oh, not many. But for us, this is, this, is, this is true. And I know that when we have these conversations, um, and we try, to, we try to teach as we go along, um, sometimes families just get so mad at us. Because we are pulling the blanket back off of a problem that's already been there, and we're messing with the bee's nest. You see that? So the goal of today was to get you into the conversation a little bit to help you understand why it is we even go there. Um, 
But next week we're going to move into confirmation. We will come back to this throughout the years. Don't worry. Um, we're going to move on. That's enough for today. Um, but if you have any questions about this or just struggling, and be like, no, 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 I can't buy it, come talk to any of the pastors, set up an appointment, and we'll switch, sit down. If you want to read some more, um, basically, this book does a really good job of outlining both the teachings of what baptism is from a Lutheran perspective and why it is, how it is appropriate to handle it. Both as a lay person and as a pastor, we have copies of this. And, uh, and we're just going to pause now and pray. Because... You know what would be a really, really good place for these conversations to happen? Before they come to our office. Do you know the power of when a parent talks to their children about this kind of stuff and their grandchildren, and then they come to the pastor and hear the same thing? It's like the Power Rangers when they all put their hands in the middle. <laughs> the Power Rangers unite, or the Care Bears where they do the <laughs> Right? It's way, way more I just got reintroduced to the Care Bears. Anyone grow up with the Care Bears? Oh man, they're so cheesy. But they're so cool. They have their bellies and it's a rainbow and it's all so nice. This has nothing to do with anything but anyone from the gummy bear generation? Can anyone sing a song? Oh, that's another day. Whatever. No, no, that's a good one. Kids are coming. Alan say, please pray. <laughs> Fraggle Rock? Okay, anyway, it's <laughs> Come on in, kids. We're going to pray. So go ahead and fold your hands as we're doing it. We bow our heads and we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for every gift, and especially the gift of faith, the gift of baptism, that we can cling to this knowing you have done your work. And now we pray that those who are baptized who have been called into your glory, now can follow. Give us humility and patience. Teach us and guide us that we may be a witness and a light to you, that we may equip our children to face this, this uh, world, that we may continue with the struggles of co-workers and what it's like to live in an ever more increasingly hostile world to, to your faith and your belief and your truths. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us as a congregation. That we'd be unified in these things. That we may follow you in your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.